Double outlet right ventricle is a controversial topic, has been a controversial topic, and remains a controversial topic. We've already touched on some of the controversy in our previous session discussing tetralogy, but I think we can discuss these problems and hopefully provide a satisfactory resolution. Because nowadays, it is accepted that the definition of double outlet right ventricle is, as you see here, those hearts in which the outflow tracts, for their greater part, are supported by the morphologically right ventricle. This definition has been in use in Europe, in fact, since 1976. But, fortunately, this approach to double outlet was endorsed by the Society of Thoracic Surgeons and the European Association of Cardiothoracic Surgeons when they produced their supplement in Annals of Thoracic Surgery, which established their coding system, bringing them in line with the cardiac code. But we cannot deny the fact that previously there have been problems, and there are still some who insist that to have double outlet, we must have bilateral infundibulums. There are still those who argue concerning the relationship to tetralogy of fallow. And we have always determined this relationship on the basis of the 50% rule. And for many years, the 50% rule itself has been controversial. Those arguing that uh, a patient who has tetralogy of fallow with double outlet is someone who is dead so that they don't have to go into the statistics. But that approach is a... I, no, I think not worthy of uh, appropriate consideration. But we cannot deny that the 50% rule has been difficult to apply in the past. But in my own opinion, the recent advances made in tomographic imaging mean that now you all have the wherewithal to arbitrate the 50% rule with far more accuracy than we do in the autopsy rule room. And I'll very shortly... So from the outset, we must accept that many patients with double outlet right ventricle do have bilateral infundibulums. And here is a classical example where you see the aorta and the pulmonary trunk both, ar both arising unequivocally from the morphologically right ventricle, which we see with the tricuspid valve entering the coarsely trabeculated chamber. And we see that beneath the aortic valve there is an extensive infundibulum as there is beneath the trunk. By the same token, we must also accept that hearts exist of this type, in which the aorta for 95% of its circumference is supported above the morphologically right ventricle, and yet in the roof of the interventricular communication there is fibrous continuity between the leaflets of the aortic and mitral valve. And if this ventricular arterial connection is not double outlet, then what are we to call it? And as we have already discussed, the morphological method establishes that we should not define one variable structure on the basis of another feature that is itself variable, and that, to my mind, rules out insistence on, double, on bilateral infundibulums as being a criterion for diagnosis of double outlet right ventricle. So perhaps more problematic is the relationship to tetralogy of fallow. But if we take the stance that double outlet itself is no more and no less than a ventricular arterial connection, whereas tetralogy is abnormal morphology and is defined on the basis of its phenotype, then I believe that the evidence is very strong, as you have seen already, that tetralogy can coexist with double outlet ventricular arterial connection. That is not to say, of course, that all examples of tetralogy have double outlet on the basis. On the, on the contrary, the majority of patients with tetralogy will have concordant ventricular arterial connections. But we cannot deny that a subset of those with the phenotypic morphology of tetralogy have the majority of the aorta arising from the right ventricle, giving us the double outlet connection. And we also very occasionally come across cases like this one, which is another of the splendid hearts from the Liverpool collection, photographed for me by Dr. Smith. And you see that in this instance, 
The pulmonary trunk unequivocally shows the features of Tetralgia fallow. The aorta overrides the ventricular septal defect. There is subpulmonary obstruction, but there is an extensive infundibulum that is separating the aortic valve from the mitral valve. So, tetralogy certainly can exist with double outlet and can also exist with bilateral infundibulums. But perhaps the thing that has given most problems in application as opposed to theory has been the 50% rule. And the 50% rule is no more than distinguishing those hearts in which the outlets each arise from their own ventricle as opposed to those hearts in which the outlets predominantly come from the same ventricle. And we cannot doubt the fact that there is a spectrum between these extremes and those hearts making up the spectrum are the ones with overriding arterial valves. And it is those patients and those hearts we categorize according to the 50% rule. And to do this, we need to assess the degree of override, not in the long axis, because as has been pointed out very many times, assessment in the long axis produces changes at different points of the cardiac cycle. What we have to do, as I show you in my cartoon here, is look up the barrels of the ventricle from the apex and then assess the relationship of the arterial trunks to the ventricular septum. And as my cartoon shows you, in the normal situation, part of the aortic root overlies the ventricular septum, but unequivocally in the normal situation, the entirety of the aorta is supported by left ventricular structures. So this is not aortic override. We see aortic override in the presence of all ventricular septal defects, which are perimembranous. Because in this circumstance, since the heart has come apart between the crest of the ventricular septum and the right ventricular structures, we now see that part of the aortic root that is supported within the right ventricle. But in most instances, although this small part of the overriding aortic root is now unequivocally attached in the right ventricle, the larger part retains its connection to the left ventricle in fibrous continuity with the mitral valve in the concordant ventricular arterial connections. But when we see a situation like this, in which the larger part of the aorta is now connected to right ventricular structures and the lesser part is connected to left ventricular structures, then in terms of the effective connections, double outlet. So in order to arbitrate between those two situations, we have to assess the degree of override of the aortic trunk relative to the cord subtended by the ventricular septum. And so in the situation where the lesser part of the overriding aorta is connected to right ventricular structures, the greater part supported by the left ventricle, we diagnose the presence of concordant ventricular arterial connections. But as soon as the situation is such that it is the greater part of the overriding aortic root supported in the right ventricle and the lesser part within the left ventricle, then as long as the pulmonary trunk is also supported by the right ventricle, the diagnosis becomes double outlet right ventricle. And it is my belief that the imaging techniques now at your disposal permit you to make this distinction using the short axis of the arterial trunk relative to the ventricular septum. So I still maintain that the pragmatic definition of the double outlet connection is more than half of both arterial trunks supported in the instance of double outlet right ventricle by the morphologically right ventricle. The understanding of the variance are made understandable when we appreciate the way that the components of the right ventricular outflow tracts are related one to the other.